what risks does your company need to be protected against? If it's the risk of a fire in a data center or a minor electrical outage, guess what? Multi-AZ is fine. You don't need to be multi-region because, again, it's multiple data centers when you're multi-AZ. Welcome to Screaming in the Cloud. I'm Corey Quinn. You may know my guest today from the reInvent stage or from various YouTube videos or, you know, blogs if you're more of the reading type. Seth Elliott was a principal solutions architect at AWS and is currently between roles. Seth, you're free. What's it like to suddenly not have to go to work at an enterprise style company, which I think is where you spent your entire career? No, instead I'm working full time doing interviews. (laughs) It's another job to have. It's a lot less process, a lot fewer uh, stakeholders have to sign off on these things most of the time. Be your own boss, you know, work from home. <laughs> well, what's not to like? But, you know, hey, you know, after hearing this conversation, if anyone out there thinks they could use my skills as a cloud architect with a focus on resilience, I'm on LinkedIn. That's Elliot with one L and one T. And we will, of course, toss that into the show notes. Backblaze B2B cloud storage helps you scale applications and deliver services globally. Egress is free up to three times the amount of data you have stored and completely free between S3 compatible Backblaze and leading CDN and compute providers like Fastly, Cloudflare, Vulture, and CoreWeave. Visit backblaze.com to learn more. Backblaze, cloud storage built better. You've been talking for a while now about something that I've always had a strange relationship with, specifically the well-architected framework, tools, team, process, et cetera, at AWS. What is your involvement with that whole well-architected sphere? So actually, I was uh, had a really interesting job we could talk about in another question about it as an AWS solutions architect embedded in Amazon.com, not working for AWS, but working for Amazon. But my first job in AWS was as global reliability lead for AWS well-architected. So there were five pillars at the time. There are six now. Let's see if I can remember them. Operational excellence, performance, security, reliability, cost, and the sixth is sustainability. Uh, cost might be of some interest to you, Corey. I'm not sure. But I joined that team as reliability lead. There is. Computers tend to do interesting things in that sense, but we'll roll with it. A question that I always had when I first heard about the well-architected framework coming out was, oh, great, I may, might be about to learn a whole bunch of things. And I've got to be direct. I was slightly disappointed when I first saw it because it's, well, this is just stuff. This is how you're supposed to build on the cloud. Who's worked in operations and doesn't know these things? And then I started talking to a whole bunch of AWS customers, and it turns out lots of them, lots of them have not thought about these things because not everyone is an old grumpy sysadmin like I am. And where you sort of learn exactly why through painful experience, you you do things the way that you do. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, certainly. Certainly the performance pillar would play a role here in terms of this recording and and the lag issue. But yeah, all the pillars are important and they're a really great resource. Basically, they're just a set of best practices that everyone should be knowledgeable about in building the cloud. And if you take a conscientious decision to not do one of those best practices, we want you to make sure it's a conscientious decision and not just a a decision of omission. Um, What I found, though, about it, and you mentioned this when you talked about the well-architected tool, is that people tend to think of well-architected as the well-architected tool. And it's not. It's Well-architected is the best practices, and the tool is a great resource by which you could sit down with six of your friends that you work with from all different parts of the company and do a multi-hour, sometimes multi-day deep dive review going through each of the best practices and checking the boxes. And that actually is useful if you're actually the right people there and you have the right conversations. But what I was finding was people were not doing that. They were just doing it as a checkbox exercise, checking, checking it off in an hour. And that's not useful. So when I joined, I wanted to bring the best practices to the people, democratize them. So a couple of things that I did, I led the effort to rewrite my pillar and all my pillar leads followed suit so that it's now on the web. It's not a PDF, not an 80-page PDF, but it's on the web with hyperlinks to each section and hyperlinks to each best practice. So I want to know about just disaster recovery, I could zip right in there. And the other thing I did is, like you said, I got on stage, I wrote blogs. I wanted to get the best practices into people's hands, how they wanted it. Whether they wanted to do a review or not, 
And reviews are useful, don't get me wrong, but whether they want to do a review or not, I want to make sure they had those best practices. It always felt like something of a maturity model where it's easy to misinterpret the, okay, what is your maturity along a variety of axes in different arenas? The goal is not to get a perfect score on everything. It's to understand where you are with these along these various uh, pillars, as you, to use your term, and figure out where you need to be on those pillars. Not everything needs to excel across the entire universe of well-architected. If, you, if you're making that decision, it should be a conscious decision rather than, well, apparently cost is not something we care about here after the fact. You'll care about it when you get your bill, right? Um, I- exactly. So that's why I, I presented the best practices as I did. That's why I would talk one-on-one with customers. I mean, basically, a well-architected review only works well if you're having a conversation, if you're just going to a checkbox, checkbox exercise, then don't even bother. It's not going to really tell you anything. So I decided there's too many ways to have conversations. One is with the tool and the, and there's another at a whiteboard and there's another on a stage and there's all kinds of ways to have conversations. And I'm talking about conversations with the engineers and the business, right? Like, like if we're going to like disaster recovery objectives. Guess what? That's a business decision. That's not a technical decision. It's a technical implementation, but your business better, you know, you better work with them to understand what those disaster recovery objectives are. In the time before cloud, I was, I I wound up being assigned to build out a a mail server for a company that I worked at. That's where I come from is relatively large scale email systems. And my question was, okay, great. What is the acceptable downtime for this thing? And their answer was no downtime is acceptable. It's Okay, so we'll start with five nines and figure it out from there, which you won't get in a single facility. So we'll have that in multiple data centers because it was before cloud. That'll start at around $20 million. Um, when can I tap the first portion of the budget? Which led to a negotiation. It turned out what they meant was we kind of like it to mostly be available during business hours with an added bonus outside of that. Okay, that, that dramatically lowered the cost, but it was a negotiation with the business. There is kind of this lever that, you know, and we talk about pillars being in intention with each other. There's this this lever, cost versus resilience, right? And it's not always that. You can definitely add resilience without additional cost by doing certain smart things and optimizations. But very often, it's that cost resilience lever. And I try to talk to customers about it and say, you have to decide where you want that lever to be. There's no magic formula that you get you know, lowest cost and highest resilience at the same time. You were embedded in an Amazon team before you wound up moving over to AWS? Were you working on the uh, the equivalent of the responsibility model or the actual responsibility model? I confess I don't know much about the internal workings of the Amazon behemoth. I was embedded in several teams. I've been, I actually started at Amazon in 2005 when it was this relatively small company in, in, in Seattle. I remember in 2005, like when I moved here and I would like go to like a gym and they say, oh, we have discount for Microsoft members. Are you a Microsoft member? I said, no, I work for Amazon. They're like, nah, we don't have discount for them. Like they're too small. <laughs> So uh, I, I started out on the catalog team, deep into you know um, the 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 inner workings. Of later worked on the team that launched Prime Video. It was called Amazon Unbox at the time. Uh, if anybody out there remembers that, I uh, then took a, a, a break for a little period of time. If you want to call working at Microsoft a break, <laughs> it was actually quite rewarding. Yeah, for a brief half decade or so. Yeah, it worked out. <laughs> I worked at uh, Amazon Fresh, and I worked in international technology. And then the role I told was telling you about before was the was the most interesting one, where I was embedded as one of only two AWS focused solution architects in all of Amazon.com, not counting AWS, but in Amazon.com, working across Amazon teams in 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 obviously in Seattle, but in in, in Tokyo, in Beijing, in Luxembourg, in Germany, on their adoption and modernization on AWS. And that was a really cool and interesting job. And I got to see how, you know, teams build with AWS a wide variety. And the number one thing, interestingly enough, is that the cool thing about internally at Amazon is that cost is a first class metric. You'd be happy to know that everybody I talk to when I'm talking about system design and architecture, they ask about cost. Should we use Lambda? Lambda seems cool. I don't want to maintain servers. Okay, how much is it going to cost? And we'd have to work through those numbers and make a decision. Is it worth the cost? So Cost is a, is a first-class metric inside Amazon.com. Which makes a fair bit of sense. I mean, obviously, things like performance and durability are as well, sorry, reliability are as well. The idea of having a, in fact, you folks, uh, I, don't, I forget if you, I don't remember the exact timing on this. So you may have been at AWS by then, but they 
they came out with a shared responsibility model for resilience as opposed to the one for security, which I always somewhat cynically tended to view as, well, you have to put in the shared responsibility model because when someone gets breached, you need to drag that out for 45 minutes. You can't just say, you left it misconfigured. It's your fault. We wash our hands of you. Well, Corey, you're looking at one of the co-authors of that shared responsibility model. So there was already a shared responsibility model for security. And Alex Livingston and myself wrote a white paper on disaster recovery, which became very, very popular in late 2020 and early 2021. And we could talk about why, (laughs) but we wrote a, a white paper on disaster recovery. And in there, we put the shared responsibility model for resiliency. And that does since has been backported into the reliability pillar too. And it's important actually to say, hey, look, you're talking about myths, right? There's a myth on some people's part that says to be make it more resilient, we put it in the cloud. We put it in the cloud, it's now more resilient. That that you know, that is not necessarily so. You put it in the cloud and you take these steps, being those steps being the best practices in the reliability pillar and the operational excellence pillar, and now it's more resilient. You can't just count on the cloud to do everything for you. One of the inherent tensions behind the way to approach resilience is it, it cuts in the it cuts the, against the grain of the idea of the cost pillar, where you get to make an investment decision of do you invest in saving money or do you spend the money to wind up build boosting your resilience? And it's rarely an all or nothing approach, but it's always been tricky to message that from the position of AWS because it sounds an awful lot like we, we would like to see more data transfer and maybe twice as many instances in different regions or availabilities zones. That would be swell. That's the right way to do it. It it rings a little hollow, though. I have no doubt that was in no way, shape, or form your intention at the time. As I said, it's sometimes a lever. I mean, but it's sometimes not. Like if you're running on EC2 instances and you switch over to like Kubernetes and put your stuff on pods, you could be using a lot less EC2 instances and have a lot more pods in place and you make yourself more resilient. So it's not always more cost. But if you're talking about disaster recovery, a question I used to get a lot is, do I need to be multi-region? Okay, I'm multi-AZ, multi-availability zone. And for folks that might not know, that means I'm in multiple physical data centers, but I'm still within a single region. Uh, that gets, makes me highly resilient if I've taken, or highly available, I should say, if I've taken the right steps to architect it. But do I need to be multi-region? And when I go multi-region, yeah, I'm going to be setting up infrastructure in another region, and that's probably going to increase my costs. So when answering that question, I always ask, what risks are you trying to protect yourself against? That's Again, it's a business question, right? What risks does your company need to be protected against. If it's the risk of a fire in a data center or a minor electrical outage, guess what? Multi-AZ is fine. You don't need to be multi-region because again, it's multiple data centers when you're multi-AZ. So then people say, why do I need to be multi-region? And the first thing that comes to mind is, oh, a comet, you know, wiping out the Eastern Seam board or a nuclear bomb or you know something like that and guess what that's never happened yet i mean uh, yesterday's performance is no guarantee of tomorrow's returns but no comets no nuclear bombs right there's there's also the idea that okay assume that you do lose the entire us east coast somehow how much are people going to care about your specific web app i kind of guess not that much in that extreme example there's a question of what level disaster are you bracing for? Yeah, we talk about that too. Your disaster recovery strategy is part of your business continuity plan. Do you have a plan for getting workers in front of keyboards? Do you have a plan for your supply chain if the Eastern Seaboard is wiped out? If not, don't worry about the tech right now. It's not important. But I was standing in front of a crowd once teaching a course, and I gave the whole, you don't have to worry about nuclear bombs for your service probably. And then I realized I was like literally in Washington, D.C. talking to public sector. I'm like, well, maybe some of you do. <laughs> maybe, maybe that is on your business continuity plan. One thing that I'll see a lot when people try to go with multiple regions is that they'll they'll very often, ah, we don't want a single point of failure. So we're going to use a go multiple regions with a second region. And then after a whole lot of work and expense and time, they built a second single point of failure. <laughs> That's funny. But um but there is a reason, there is a legitimate reason to go multi region. And and you know what it is. Do you care to venture a a guess on what that is? In many cases, there's the idea of a few things. You can separate out uh, different phases of what's going on in your environment at different times. You are, there is a, there's a hard control plane separation. So if there's a a region-wide service outage, theoretically, you can wind up avoiding that by being in multiple regions. And of course, there's always the question of getting closer to customers too. Oh yeah. Well, that's not a resilience issue. That's a performance issue. And that's a legitimate reason to go multi-region. But yeah, the number one thing that the actual risk we have seen, and across all cloud providers, this is not a slam on AWS, all cloud providers is 
an event in a service or or cloud provider owned network. And if you have a hard dependency on that service, or unfortunately, if you have a hard dependency on other services that depend on that service, then you need a plan to be able to go to another region. So I mentioned how our disaster recovery white paper became really popular in 2021. That's because in 20, December 2020, there was a Kinesis event in US East One. And I don't know how many people use Kinesis, uh, but that wasn't, but a lot of AWS services apparently at the time used Kinesis. So, like I think CloudWatch, I don't, I could be wrong, double check me on that. But so people were affected. And so if you need to protect yourself against that, and again, it's all cloud providers, and actually AWS likes to show data that is objectively true, that they have the least number of these events of all the major cloud providers. But if you need to protect yourself against those events, you need to be multi-region. Well, when you do talk about multiple cloud providers, there's also the question of, okay, great. Well, Amazon themselves is a single point of failure. The credit card payment instrument that I have on file for my AWS account is, in fact, a single point of failure to some extent. And I'll see companies, in some cases, storing uh, rehydrate the business level backups in another provider where they're certainly not going to be active active, but they don't have to shut down as a going concern in the event that something catastrophic happens AWS wide. Yeah, again, it's about risk assessment. If you're afraid of your cloud provider going belly up in some reason, that, I think that's a pretty, pretty low risk. But you're right, taking the step of just doing backups of your data and infrastructure to another cloud provider without any of the operational ability to bring it up quickly. You're just, this is the, oh crap, recovery scenario. I know it's going to take a long time. My recovery time is going to be extended, but this is like, I don't care that it's a long RTO because it's protecting myself against a risk that's probably never, never going to happen. That seems legitimate. But yeah, uh, I was just simply trying to say not protect yourself against your cloud provider, but protect yourself against an event in a region of your cloud provider. I know of at least one company that winds up having to rehydrate the le- the backups level of infrastructure and another provider specifically so they don't have to call it out as strongly as a risk factor in their quarterly filings. Like in some cases, it's just easier to do it and stop trying to explain this to the auditor every quarter and just smile, nod, and do the easier thing. It, it comes down to being, again, a business decision. And it, that could be fairly low effort to implement. It's going to cost you. Data transfer is going to cost you. Data storage on the other provider is going to cost you. But it, yeah, unlike a full... So, you know, when I talk about disaster recovery, uh, I, I adopted the model that it pre-existed before me at AWS of four strategies, backup and recovery, which is the one we're talking about now. Very easy to do, but very long recovery times and longer uh, recovery points, although not always. And then go- moving towards uh, shorter recovery times, you could have a, a, a pilot light, or you could have a warm standby, or you could have an active active, and which I consider to be uh, both a high availability and disaster recovery strategy. Some of my colleagues at AWS considered it not to be a disaster recovery strategy, but that's an argument. I don't know if it's worth getting into. One thing that I found when I was doing my own analysis for the stuff that I built, I have an overly complicated system that does my newsletter publication every week. And it's exclusively in US West too, in AWS in Oregon. And the services that I use are all, as it turns out, multi-AZ. So there's really no reason for me to focus on resilience in any meaningful sense. Because if Oregon is unreachable as a region for multiple days. Well, that week I can write the newsletter by hand because I think I'm going to have a bigger story to talk about than they released yet another CloudFront edge pop in Dallas. No, it's part of the plan, Corey. They're bringing you down so you can't write about the outage. But honestly, um, you, you are resilient. You're highly available, but you're not. You don't have a disaster recovery strategy because you don't need one. So, you know, just to be clear, you know, resilience has that high availability piece. I'm in multiple availability zones. I could I could tolerate component level failures versus disaster recovery where I need to stand myself up somewhere else. One mistake I see people making, especially in the multi-cloud direction is, OK, we're an e-commerce store. So we're going to either build entirely on Azure or we're going to go multi-cloud. So in the event that AWS has an outage, we're not exposed to it. In practice, what they do is they expose themselves to everyone's vulnerability unless they're extremely careful. And if they're, I don't know, using Stripe to process payments, Stripe is all in on AWS. So great. We're now living on Azure, but our payment vendor has the dependency on AWS. So when there's an actual serious outage, you wind up with dependency issues that are several layers removed. Some cases, your vendors know about it, and many more, they don't. So when we see things like that giant S3 issue about seven years ago, well, that's one of those things where everyone's learning an awful lot about the various interchain dependencies as you go down this path. Though on the plus side, for most of us, 
On that day, just the internet is having a bad day. So we don't have to spend a lot of time explaining why we alone are down. It's there's safety in numbers. First of all, you know, you're still talking about S3 from over a decade ago. I need to educate you on more recent events. So you have more <laughs> recent stuff to, to talk about. But uh, as for your point of dependencies, that's so true because we have customers that'll look at, we used to publish, well, we publish SLAs, but those are not guaranteed numbers. Those are just a cost agreement of what any, any provider is going to credit you. And we used to publish the design for reliability. They since took them away. It used to be part of the reliability white paper. And you'd see the number of nines designed for EC2 and S3. And people would like to try to take those numbers and do the availability math. Availability math says if I have redundant ones, I could like you know, if I have two things that are four nines and I put them redundantly, then I now have eight nines. But if I have two things that are four nines and and they're in parallel on e- with each other, I have to multiply the errors times each other, and I have less than four nines. But and and that availability math is well known. And and but you try to do that it is the way to madness, right? Because yeah, you've done that with all the components in AWS. But how about those third party providers? How about DNS? How about the internet, you know, having problems, you know, like you're not accounting for all those other things. So I think you're not getting a real number when you do that. And even when you're doing DR testing, you have these scenarios where, okay, we've tested our ability to fail between regions. But what you haven't done is tested your ability to fail between regions when everyone else in that region is doing something similar, because it's not just you doing this at three o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. Suddenly there is a service wide outage. We'll, we'll avoid picking on S3 further. But when everyone is starting to evacuate, you often see like even an even older issue. We saw that with EBS volume failures in US East 1, I want to say in 2012, where suddenly there was the herd of elephants problem that we all learned a lot from. So Thundering Herd is more of an issue if you're in an availability zone in a region and that availability zone is having issues and there's only two more availability zones to go. So everybody's going to those two availability zones. That's a real uh, Thundering Herd issue, especially if you're looking for EC2 availability, instance availability. You're, the type you want, if you're not flexible, might be gone by the time you get over there. When you're talking about multi-region, it's less so because, it, especially if you're in the U.S., you have multiple re- is for commercial regions. So you're, a, a, there's no guarantee everybody's even going to the same region. But B, most people aren't even failing over, right? Not everybody has a multi-region strategy. So we actually haven't seen Thundering Herd happen with multi-region failover. What we have seen happen is control plane dependency. So I actually added this into the reliability pillar pretty late. It was like the last two best practices I added to my, you know, to the reliability pillar, which was don't take hard dependencies on the control plane if you could help it. Because what way, the way this works is for every service you use, if it's a regional service like S3 or EC2, there's a data plane and there's a control plane in that region. Data plane is basically the stuff running all the time to service actual requests. Control plane are the CRUD operations, create, modify, update, delete. The gotcha is if you're using a, a, a global service like Route 53, at the time when I last was at AWS, had a single control plane in US East 1. And so what happened was, I think this was a 2021 outage, maybe uh, event or 2022. We saw an outage in US East 1. It was a network outage and it brought down the control plane for Route 53 so that people couldn't modify their Route 53 records, which was how they planned to do a failover. So they couldn't fail over. Now there are solutions to this. The solution is choose a data plane strategy instead. Since then, uh, AWS has come out with Application Recovery Controller, which uh, I want to hear from you, Kari, what, what you think of the cost benefit of that is. It, it's a little spendy, but you could also roll your own Application Recovery Controller by doing something like creating a CloudWatch alarm, connecting that to a Route 53 health check, and having that CloudWatch alarm not check for health because that's not reliable, but literally check, is there an object with this name in S3? If not, alarm. And then you could delete that object data plane operation, the alarm will go off, data plane operation, the Route 53 health check will go off, data plane operation, and it'll swap over. It's very helpful. I I do like the application recovery controller. The challenge is it starts at two grand a month, which means for small scale experiments that that gets a little pricey just to kick the tires on and really get a lot of hands-on experience with it. But for the large scale sites that use it, it's, it's who cares money. They're thrilled to be able to have something like that. So it's just a question of who the, who the product is actually for. On the topic of control planes, one of the challenges I've run into in the past is it's not just is the control plane available, but is it latent? At some point when you have a bunch of folks spinning up EC2 instances, 
yeah, the, the SLA on the data plane of those instances is still there, but it might take 45 minutes to get enough capacity to spin up just by the time that your request gets actioned. Yeah, and, and that's taking a dependency on a control plane. Even, even if you're multi-AZ, if your plan is, I need to use auto-scaling to spin up EC2 instances in the two remaining healthy availability zones, that's control plane. If you want to avoid that, you need to be statically stable and have capacity. If you're, if you're across a three availability zones, then having full capacity in two of them means you're 50% over-provisioned in a given availability zone. The math works, right? So that's something you have to be willing to pay for. Or take the dependency on the control plane, and it'll probably work, but you're, you're, you're taking on more risk. And this, again, is driven by business need. If you were to take a look at the entire resiliency landscape, as, as, as my last question, this is something I'm, I'm deeply curious about. What do you see people getting wrong the most that you wish they wouldn't in 2024? I think in general, what, what, what we're looking at is people not understanding how the cloud is different, I think, when they're moving from on-prem. I'm not talking about your mature folks in the cloud, but folks looking to adopt cloud for the first time. It needs to be explained to them that an availability zone is not only a data center, it's mul multiple data centers. And the other availability zone, guess what? That's a completely separate set of data centers. So like if you're on-prem strategies to be in two data centers, woo, two, <laughs> that are like 400 miles apart, and that's a really far distance, so there's no chance those two are going to be affected by each other, even 1,000 miles apart. Guess what? When you move to AWS or, you know, at least with AWS's availability zone model, if your two availability zones are not 400 miles apart, they're only between 10 and 30 miles apart. But AWS has put in a lot of effort, and I've seen some of these reports. I've seen the reports include the geological survey and the floodplain analysis so that these availability zones are not sharing the same floodplain and that if any disaster happens, it's unlikely that it should affect more than one availability zone. So guess what? You don't have to be 1,000 miles apart. You don't have to be 400 miles apart. Being 30 miles apart is giving you almost that same benefit. Now, let's talk to your regulator, your auditor, and convince them of that too so you don't have to set up in another region a thousand miles away. I really want to thank you for taking the time to speak with me about all this. Uh, given that you're currently on the market, if people want to learn more or potentially realize that, huh, we could potentially use a cloud architect with a resiliency emphasis where we work, where's the best place for them to find you these days? Well, I mean, I'm, you know, just search for me on your, on your, on your uh, search engine of choice, Seth Elliott, E-L-I-O-T, one L, one T, throw AWS on the end of that. And you'll probably find stuff related to me, especially my LinkedIn account. That's a good way to reach me. Awesome. And we will, of course, put links to that in the show notes. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Seth Elliott, Principal Solutions Architect, currently between roles. I'm cloud economist Corey Quinn, and this is Screaming in the Cloud. If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. Whereas if you hated this podcast, please leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice along with an angry, insulting comment, because despite being in four different regions, you didn't take all of the control plane access away from Dewey, who pushed a bad configuration change and brought you down anyway. 